Okay. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Whoever is listening to us, this is our webinar about cool things you didn't know you can do with MS Logix. Uh, this webinar is going to be presented by me, Benny Tritch. I'm a, a technical evangelist working from Germany, responsible for the market in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. And uh, my colleague, Jim Moyle, is with me. Jim, do you want to introduce yourself? Certainly, Benny, thanks. Uh, so my name is Jim Moyle. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm, along with Benny, although he forgot to mention it, a uh, uh, current uh, Citrix CTP, and I work out of the UK on the technical side for FS Logics. OK, let's get started. So the idea is that we walk you through what FS Logics is within the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, let's start with where FS Logics comes from. Uh, it was started in, two, in 2013, and it had one module. We're going to talk about the module later in about two minutes. So it started with one module, and it was uh, developed further so that we have several modules that are uh, FS Logics apps today. We are at version 2.8.9 now, and uh, we're going to introduce you to the different modules. Jim, anything you want to add to that? Um, <clears throat> so it's going to be uh, it's going to be fairly quickly. We're going to try and get you as deep as possible, as quickly as possible, and uh, yeah, let's uh, let's let's jump right in, Benny. Okay, so let's take a look at the product architecture briefly. So what we have is we have the Windows operating system. So everything that FS Logix does builds on top of the Windows operating system. This is very in, uh, important to know because many other products they are building on top of a hypervisor. We are hypervisor agnostic. So what we have is we have a FS Logix core engine that builds on top of the Windows OS. And it includes uh, two filter drivers and a Windows service. It also allows you to attach VHD in a very specific way. So uh, to the operating system, the FS Logix containers or VHDs that are attached are in-guest VHDs. And they are not distinguishable from local folders for the uh, local file system or for the operating system. So on top of the FS Logix core engine, uh, there are several modules. Today, we have four modules. It's the, the four product modules that you can purchase. And, uh, well, you can add more modules. So uh, stay tuned for the future. So Jim, uh, he will present some things at the end of our session today, which may become a module number five. But this is uh, the basic product architecture. Uh, I mean, if you want to configure it, you use uh, rules. Uh, it can either be um, text files uh, to define the rules. When we configure the core engine, we're using registry keys. So we can deploy it using uh, group policy or group policy preferences. So that's what I want to, uh, um, well, yeah. to, to introduce you to the product architecture. Did I forget so that's something? A, uh, well, we'll just expand on that a little bit, I think, Benny. OK. So, so one of the things that's really important about this diagram is not what's there, but what's not there. So you do not see any SQL servers here. You do not see any web servers. You do not see any application servers. All that's needed for the products, all four of the products to operate, is contained within the client OS. This is key for a couple of reasons. One, it's totally scalable. So whether you've got 100 or 100,000 different um, <clears throat> endpoints, it doesn't matter because we're not bottlenecked on any centralized infrastructure. And also, it means that if there is, there's no dependence on network connectivity to a central configuration. So if for any reason, you know, you have users that are going to the cloud or going over WAN links, they will still keep working just as well uh, as they would if, if that network connection uh, was still there. So the very basic architecture enables reliability and scalability. Okay. Thank you, Jim. 
let's take it from here and go to the first module. The first module that we want to highlight is uh, FS Logic's application masking. I put the application in brackets because we can go beyond applications. So the uh, idea is to reduce the number of managed images and silos. So basically, you install one master image, one golden image, with all the applications included. And then you mask individual applications or components so that groups of users cannot see them anymore. So this allows you multiple versions of the same app in one layer or in one golden image. And then uh, mask them uh, on demand. So it is in addition to uh, what's called application layering, for example, with Citrix app layering, formerly known as Unidesk. Or you can also uh, use it together with application virtualization, like Microsoft App V. Another important feature of uh, application masking is that you can use it to control licenses of your applications. Uh, but this has to be done. Uh, together with those um, partners that do license assessment. And uh, so you have to talk to Microsoft and those people who do the assessment uh, before you can use FS Logic's application masking for that. But we have many customers that are using it for exactly that purpose. So <clears throat> I think that application masking is a sort of hidden gem of FS Logic's because it's such a powerful engine. And it tends to be that when we get into customers and they tell us the problems that they have, quite often it's like, oh, well, the application masking can fix that. So for instance, we've had customers where they've uh, tried to keep to a single golden image. They've had a, an Office Suite plugin that, uh, that only a certain percentage of people need, but they've had to include it in uh, the golden image for everybody. And it's taken their, um, Office launch time for you know Word or Excel or Outlook from what should be, let's face it, less than a second to 10, 15 seconds. Application masking can, on a per user, a per group, IP address, environment variable, OU, can mask that plugin. And then only the people who need it are suffering from the uh, additional lag of, uh, of having that included when you're doing your Office launch time. And then hence enhancing the performance for everybody else. If you've ever sequenced a single application several times, we will take that away from you by <clears throat> taking away the reasons that you need to sequence it. You know, maybe it's a, a different set of plugins or a different config. We can remediate those and make sure you've only got a single application sequence or application package. And again, as, uh, as Benny said, to, um, <clears throat> to do the same thing, to reduce the number of golden images you have, effectively simplifying the, uh, the oper operational um, <clears throat> your operational uh, stuff. Um, just a little bit more on license control. Because application masking will completely hide the application, so it'll take it away from the file system, the registry, environment variables, add remove programs, everything. It's now invisible to uh, the user layer of the OS. We can now use it for licensing, but that's not just the only part. What you need to be able to do is you need to be able to configure your license terms. So you need to say what the transferal rate of your licenses are. And you also need to be able to report on that. And all of those features are built into the product for, for license control. So you can use it. I mean, the classic example is, you know, Project Invisio. So it's very, very good at helping you out with licensing, uh, licensing those products. I think that uh, <clears throat> Benny's got a live demo now. Yeah. I yeah. I suggested doing videos. <laughs> no. But Benny, Benny in his wisdom says no. No, we, we're going to do live demo. So, so we are in fact going to do live demos for you. So I'm connecting to my live demo environment here, and as you can see, I put everything on Hyper-V. So I have my uh, demo machine running Hyper-V, and we take a look at the console right now. So we have a domain controller running in the uh, demo environment, we have a Windows Server 2016 RDSH server and a Windows 10 VM. And those uh, will create the demo environment. Now, if we look on the left side, we see that two users are already locked on to my RDSH server. So it's user Adam and it's user Berta. 
So let's take a look at the um, administrator account there. So if we refresh the environment, we see we have the admin logged in interactively, Adam and Berta. And now we want to start masking the application. So in order to do so, we needed to create the rules for the masking. That has been done prior to the demo. So the rules already exist on a file share that is hosted on my domain controller. So I have this file share where um, app masking files are stored and I have a local uh, folder where I want to move those rules to so that they're applied on the fly. Before we do so, we're going to take a look at the domain controller at the users. So what we see here is that I have access to the app masking folder. So that is what was to be expected. And we can take a look at how these individual users are configured. Um, so I take a look at Adam1. That's the user that I will be using here. So he's a member of several security groups, including Acrobat Reader, IrfanView, uh, Paint.net. And what that means is as soon as I move the rules files from the central storage to the local rules file, these rules get applied. So this is what we want to see. Now if I go here and I just grab those files and take a look at the users over here, so when I move them down here, something should happen. Before I do it, I want to demonstrate what it looks like for user Berta when I open PowerPoint. Well, this isn't PowerPoint, so she is assigned to the user group Office 365 and it's going to mask her PowerPoint. Okay, let's do it and move those files or copy the files just over to the rules folder. And on the fly, those applications are masked. So you see user Adam, all these applications that he was uh, the... Uh, security groups he was assigned to, those applications are gone. And I cannot find them in the file system anymore. I cannot find them in the registry. I cannot find them in the application installation applet. They're all gone. Now, for user Berta, it's all a little bit, uh, yeah, it's less uh, evident. So for her, she doesn't have the uh, PowerPoint uh, symbol in the logo anymore, in the icon anymore, like it does for user Adam. So what happens when I click the PowerPoint, Windows can't open this uh, type of file. So what we could configure is that PowerPoint Viewer is taken over. So this was exactly what Jim was talking about when we do the licensing control. So if not every user has a license to use full office, we could just assign uh, the viewer to this particular user group and then they can only use the viewer instead of full PowerPoint but both PowerPoint and PowerPoint viewer are installed in the same image and only by uh, using application masking we can just decide what users can see and what not so if I delete things in the rules folder again so everything is recreated on the fly. So demo number one worked perfectly well. Let's go back to the slide deck and move on to the next module, which is Java version control. So what you can do with Java version control is you can run multiple versions of Java runtimes on the same platform and assign both applications and applets to the different runtimes. So it is an automatic redirect for end users when they're using different Java runtimes on in their same session. So it doesn't require any packaging or sequencing. And that's also something that I want to demo after Jim. Uh, well, maybe you have more <laughs> insights. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this isn't actually something I thought of. This is something that uh, a customer came to us with, is that um, 
they had two bits of the business banging on in their ear. One side was the security side saying that we cannot have an old version of Java hanging around. It's full of holes. There's no way that uh, that this should exist. And they have the business as well saying, ah, we've got a line of business app which depends on this specific version of Java and we need to have it. So we as IT pros, this is, this is a situation that we commonly find ourselves in being stuck between two conflicting demands. And what the, the Java version control really helped them out because although we're never gonna go back and fix um, the security of an old Java version, what we can do is we can actually mitigate the attack surface that is available to, um, <clears throat> to the OS. So we can actually say, right, this version of Java is only allowed to be run by this process or by this URL. So effectively limited, limiting um, the uh, the attack surface of that job, and and that was a big mover for uh, for that particular customer to uh, to buy into the job. Um, just to clear up, when it says applets there, um, applets just means that in IE we can have in several different tabs in IE we can have each different tab working on a different Java version. So whether you've got a SAS app or anything else that requires a certain Java version, we can all do it seamlessly within uh, within the same browser. And I think, uh, Benny, you're also going to be brave, although I'm pretty impressed that the first one worked perfectly. You've got, you've <laughs> yeah. got a Java demo for us as well. Absolutely. I'm going to try it again and see if the demo gods are still with me. Now, for this demo, I'm going to use the Windows 10 machine. I'm locked in to this Windows 10 machine interactively. What you see here is the Afros Logics rule editor which uh, includes also all the rules, that, uh, the rules that I was using previously in my previous demo for application masking. You already see that there are Java rules in there, but let's take a closer look at the Java rule editor in order to find out what I have configured on this machine. So when we zoom in, what we can see is that I have two Java applications uh, running on this machine, both uh, well, uh, are in the C colon back slash tools folder. And one is called Java test and the other one is called Java test 2. One is assigned to uh, 1.4 version of Java, the other to 1.6. So when I run the demo, what happens is this application does nothing, but it just shows me what the Java version uh, it runs on. So if I start this app, so this one is Java test. And as you can see, it tells me that it runs Java version 1.4, exactly what I have configured. So if I click OK, and I do the same thing for Java test 1, which in fact is exactly the same application, just renamed it. I do the double click, and you see it says Java 1.6. So this gives you an impression of the power of uh, how this is done. So we can just add more Java applications and we can add more Java runtimes and assign the applications to their Java runtimes. That's what it is. Jim, anything you want to add? No, I think that's uh, that's pretty perfect. And we did have a question on Java. I'm just going to just going to answer. So um, uh, I would, would probably do questions at the end, but if it's a quick one, then I'll chuck it in. So Java's been a security issue for years. What's your thought on how you're uh, Java product impact security. So if you configure it correctly, as I mentioned, right, you can actually make sure that an old version of Java is only available to a single URL and a single process. So you can actually combine it with the app masking stuff we showed before to completely hide even it from the from the um, from the OS and from the file system. So <clears throat> you can effectively silo off that dodgy version of Java. Um, to uh, to a really extreme amount and, and as I said, reduce your attack service. Um, so we'll carry on, I think, uh, okay. Benny. Yeah, let's move on and go to the next module, which is Office 365 containers. Uh, this is the most popular module that we have in our, uh, well, that we have to offer today. And uh, what it does is it helps you to run Office, in particular, uh, Outlook, 
in non-persistent environments, which is pooled desktops or which is in RDSH or Citrix Senap environments. So what it does is it runs to um, coexisting with the existing profile management solutions that are out there and it helps you to boost Outlook performance and it helps you to solve these OST file roaming problems that you have. You can use cached exchange mode. It also supports uh, OneDrive so that you can synchronize your OneDrive folders uh, in your non-persistent environments as if you were working locally. And uh, like I said before, Outlook search roaming is a very important feature. So Outlook search roaming for Senap and RDSH. Jim, what's your take on that? So a lot of people sort of confuse um, indexing and uh, OST caching, OST caching, and, and they kind of like conflate the two uh, things together as if they're one and the same. But bear in mind that they're very different. You can have them completely independent of them. You can have an OST cache and no indexing and indexing and no OST. But it's super important to have them both to actually give the user the experience they want. Now, <clears throat> we will roam that OST uh, with the user. But even on RDSH, and now this is really difficult to do just because of the way Windows works. And we are the only people who can actually roam your index from uh, an RDSH or a Zenapp server and make that follow the user as well. Now, it isn't just for Outlook. It's, as you say, uh, OneDrive as well, and that's the full OneDrive sync client. So it's not what uh, other solutions may say where you you know you use a OneDrive online. No, this is a full integrated sync client. Um, <clears throat> and we've also got optimizations for OneNode and very shortly for all the Teams stuff as well, and Skype for business. Microsoft's doing something which is probably for them the exactly correct thing. But for those of us who manage a non-persistent desktop, it's exactly the wrong thing. And that is to get over any latency that you experience between your local data center or your local client and um, the Azure point of presence. They are pushing as much caches down to the endpoint as possible. Because the more cache you have on the endpoint, the, the less you uh, require a, a, a small amount of latency to, uh, to the Azure point of presence. So it's going to improve your performances the more cache is on your client. And, and Microsoft realizes this, and in the future, their plan is to push as much cache down to the client as possible. Good move. But as I say, for a non-persistent desktop, horrible, because we now need to cope with all of these caches. And the FS Logics Office 365 container will do exactly that. The other reason why Microsoft's very keen on this is it actually pushes the compute down onto the endpoint and saves them money in Azure. Well. So they've got both a financial and a performance reason to keep doing this as much as possible. So there is no chance that Microsoft will fix this in the future because it's against their interests. And <clears throat> because our Office 365 container product is, is one of our most popular at the moment, we will take account of all of the new stuff that Microsoft is bringing out. We will take those caches and we will roam those with the your user. Okay, hey, Jim. Can you do me a favor? Can you send me an email? Just I, I, this whole just, email yeah. so so that people can see that we do real life demos. Because what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna go back to my demo environment and I'm gonna log in as user Benny and use my real FS Logix Office 365 account in this RDSH server, which we are using for the demos. So okay, that's just Take a look at where we are now. So take a look. Let's take a look at our file server. So nothing else but the uh, app masking uh, share is being used at this moment. We're going to take a look back as soon as I'm locked in as user Benny because user Benny is using the Office 365 container, which is hosted on this uh, file server. And we also see that as of now, there's no user Benny locked in. But now, I'm going to go and log in as user Benny on this RDSH server. So, like I said, it's all in real time. 
Okay, now both the Office 365 container and the profile container, which we will be using in our next demo, is mapped. Let's take a look at computer management and the open files, do a refresh. And now we see that the Office 365 container is attached and the profiles container is attached. And it's important to notice that it's only one VHDX file that is attached for each of those containers. If you compare it to roaming profiles, you would see hundreds or thousands of individual files that are being opened uh, when a user logs in and the roaming profile is copied to the local uh, machine where the user logs in. So this is a fundamental difference. Now that we have everything up and running, I start my Outlook. And you see here, after starting Outlook, it connects to my Exchange server down here. And look at that. Jim Moyle sent me an email and wished me good luck for the demo. So this is the email that just arrived and now if I want to start searching like for Jim so this works immediately and the good thing is when I look at the search tool what is the indexing status everything has been indexed already so when I logged in I had received three or four new emails which means it took only the 10 seconds until I really looked into this dialog box for everything to be indexed. Now, you can imagine if I had done that without uh, roaming my index file, my search index file, uh, that, would, that would have taken like half hour or 45 minutes until everything is indexed and searchable. So this is what makes the user experience so good, so seamless, and uh, this shows you how this all is configured. Uh, and uh, what the performance is. Let's take a look at what my user account settings are. So if I take a look at my Office 365 account, you see that I use cached exchange mode and it keeps my emails in offline mode for 12 months. So everything is synced to the uh, RDSH server and kept locally and as soon as I log in uh, from one RDSH server to the other within a collection uh, then I have immediately have the search index file available and search works um, yeah as soon as I'm logged in. Jim anything you want to add to what I've demoed here? No that looks uh, absolutely perfect thanks very much Benny. So. Did all I'm, of your live demos were all working. I, oh. I, I must have more faith in you in future, Benny. <laughs> okay, let's go back to the slight deck. Um, and uh, just move on to this point here, because Microsoft's opinion on FS Logics Office 365 containers is that they recommend using it, because they asked uh, um, a team of uh, community uh, people, MVPs, to do some testing if Office 365 containers really work as expected. And uh, so the RDS gurus, they published a white paper uh, describing how they tested everything and what the results were. And Microsoft, they, um, they paid for this test because they wanted to know if it really works or not. And after reviewing all the results, all the raw data, all the telemetry data, they confirmed that this works as expected and they published this article on their own blog side and said, this is how you should configure Outlook in non-persistent environments. So that, that is very nice for us in, uh, in that, you know, we have been uh, vetted by Microsoft. In fact, that web page is effectively the RDS admin guide. So it's nice to uh, it's nice to have that uh, <clears throat> that lovely relationship with Microsoft that we have, and it's nice that they approve of our methods. That is absolutely correct. So the final module that we want to take a look at is the FS Logics Profile Container. Uh, you've seen it before because the Office 365 container is sort of a 
sister product or system module. It's based on the same concept. It's a little bit different from the rule set perspective. So instead of redirecting the user profile to a container, the Office 365 container redirects everything that's related to the Office applications. Um, what I want to mention here, the Office 365 container works also very well for on-prem exchange installation. So it does not necessarily require Office 365 as a backend. It also works with on-prem installation of Exchange, so you can have say, have the same benefits of uh, well search index roaming and and uh, all the other uh, features that are included. Office 365 was just better from a marketing perspective. But the technology is exactly the same for Profile Container, which allows you to have fast and consistent and stable logins. You have seen how fast it was when I logged in as user Benny, because it was also uh, attaching the uh, Profile Container VHDX. So you don't need folder redirection, because it allows you to kind of stream your uh, data which is in the user profile. You have seen the cached exchange and OST roaming features that can be also uh, applied by the profile containers, depending on if Office 365 container is installed or not. And it has the support of uh, OneDrive on Citrix. Um, hey, so, Jim, do you so want me to, to show uh, <laughs> again the uh, the <laughs> what it means as a user. Hey, I can show you something. Yeah, yeah like, um, let's take a look at the log file, for example. Yeah, why not? Let's just go back to that one user and uh, see if we can uh, just take a look in the FSLogix log file where you see how the uh, VHDX uh, containers were mounted. So we just open it and this allows us to just take a look at my profile status. So it shows me that I have a total uh, amount of space of 30 gig. I still have enough uh, space remaining on that uh, on that disk. I only I'm only using 580 megabyte uh, as of now. So that is the current situation here. If I want to go into the details, I can go into the advanced view and take a look at the profile log files and scroll down here. And if I go there, I will find the place where um, user Benny, the VHDX file was attached. So you see here that the user uh, Benny VHDX file was attached. And so um, I'm using the profile container as we speak. So, <clears throat> um, much as I respect my esteemed colleague, Benny, <laughs> I disagree with one of the words he just used there, which was profile streaming. Ah. Because, because I don't think it's actually covered in streaming, because people are used to streaming from UPMO stuff. This is not copying any data from inside the profile down into the endpoint. And it's just attaching a VHD. And <clears throat> one of the really big advantages this gives you is it effectively divorces the size of your profile from the performance of your profile. So if you're used to uh, UPM or even roaming profiles or any other profile solution out there, there's, there's quite a few of them out there then what you've got to do is you've got to make sure that you're reducing the amount of data that you're copying in and either you're redirecting it or you're streaming it in or you're holding it in some database there. And there's a lot of work, so do I need this? How should I cope with this particular file, this particular folder? There's absolutely none of that with our profile containers because once you, as I say, have divorced the performance from the size, you now no longer care what's in that profile container. I agree with you, Jim. Uh, and uh, I'm yeah. only using the term streaming because I want to refer to one specific uh, element uh, of what we do. We open only one file, and then on demand, we copy, which is the VHDX file, which is the container. And then we copy only the data 
that is required by applications or the system on demand. So it's only one open connection, not yeah. many, many connections. And this is why I refer to it as streaming. But I agree with you that is only one mini aspect <laughs> of what real streaming is. OK, agree. So <laughs> there we go. Um, <clears throat> So one of the things that happens now, you don't have to worry about accepting or including different bits of data from your profile. You can just stick it all in there. So all your operational effort of managing these just suddenly goes away. And you can say, I'll just stick everything in there. And one of the big advantages of doing that is compatibility. So you're not going to run into programs that uh, don't like um, folder redirection. You're not going to run into programs that don't like anything on a network location because all that Windows thinks is this is a local profile. So now you have a profile solution that is fast, efficient, and doesn't take any feeding and watering. It just works. And I think we should probably have a demo on that. Now, this is my demo. So I'm doing the video. I'm not brave like Benny is. I'm going to do a uh, going to do a, a a a live demo, but I'm also we can change the slide if you want, Benny. So you want me to roll the video? Yeah, roll VT. Yay! I am not going to show you roaming settings from one session to another. Everybody has seen that demo a million times. This is a user who's logging on with their VHD in their local data center. Now I don't have a load of GPOs in my lab, so that took you know three or four seconds. So great, you can see we've got a really fast logon. I'm going to do something slightly different here. So now the profile VHD is stored in Amazon S3. Now this is going to take a couple of seconds longer because there is latency to take care of between the, uh, the local data center and Amazon. But even so, we can see we've now launched um, that profile in Amazon super quick. Well, what about? Azure. Well, let's have a look at Azure. Now, Azure doesn't have quite the same caching mechanisms Amazon does. So again, it's a, a second or two slower. But now we can see that we, and this is all the same RDSH server as well. We see that we're going to log into uh, uh, the desktop. And key here, you know, I said we divorced it from the size. It's actually two gigs worth of data in that, on that desktop in that profile. And it didn't affect our logon speed, even when that profile stored in uh, Azure. Now we can see in disk management, we've got three VHDs attached to that RDSH server. And we're going to look in, we're going to look in detached VHD because it shows us the path. Uh, there's easy to do. And I'm going to make a mistake here. There you go. I detached it accidentally. But what we do is we recover from that. So if you, that's what shows you is that if you have any network problems, then your profile will recover immediately um, if it then comes back. And then we can see in the detach uh, dialog here that again, you know, file.core.windows.net, that is, that is um, uh, Azure file storage. Did you do that on purpose? I Action. didn't, but <laughs> I didn't do that on purpose. So, but when I looked at the recording, I'm like, I might, that actually shows a nice feature. So I'm going to keep my own mistake in the video and show my mistakes to everybody, Eddie. Yeah, we have received a question here. Uh, is that the end of the video? So can we, can we? So yeah, that's the question? absolutely end yeah. of the video. video. Because, let's, let's go for the question. Because there was a question about IOPS. Can you shed some light on the IOPS that we see with the VHD stuff that we're doing? So um, IOPS is an interesting question because The increase in uh, or a difference in IOPS will happen when you have um, your Office 365 container and your profile container. Now, let's take, uh, let's take the Office 365 first. If you're currently in online mode, and actually this will cover another question somebody asking about online mode. Previously, everybody said do online mode. And the only reason that they've said that as a best practice is because it doesn't work if you do anything else. Now, me, we make it work. So if you're changing from online mode to a local cache of your mailbox, there will be an increase in uh, storage capacity and storage performance needed to host those VHDs. Now, having said that, 
sticking those OST files inside of VHD actually gives you a lot of optimizations built in. And this isn't us doing it. This is this is Microsoft doing it. They've got uh, a whole lot of optimizations for VHDs because VHDs are part of Hyper-V. So effectively, it's much more efficient in terms of resources on your centralized storage if you're storing files inside of VHD than if you're storing them raw on there. Not only in terms of I.O., but also more importantly in terms of open file handles and <clears throat> just that sort of metadata um, uh, resource constraint that tends to go on the uh, storage controllers rather than anywhere else um, inside your, your storage. So you'll generally get a decrease in I.O. over what would happen with Microsoft Naturally. Now, as far as profile containers go, that works exactly the same way. You just get the advantages of having stuff inside of VHD, much less opens and closes of files, much fewer uh, file handles, uh, SMB channels, IOPS, compared to what it would have been normally. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, so in a nutshell, uh, that means that we still put a lot of stuff on the file server, but it generates less IOPS. Yes. That's in a nutshell what you just said. Okay. So so you, so you answered the question in, in two seconds and I took about 30. Well, that's, yeah, but you were, more, you, fine, you were more <laughs> accurate. You were a lot more accurate. Okay, so we have some advanced configuration uh, topics for the end of our, our uh, webinar. Uh, Jim, that's your thing. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is. Thank you, Betty. Um, <laughs> So there are other solutions out there which offer a profile within a, a VHD or a VHDX. Now, for instance, Microsoft uh, UPD does this. But there's one big problem with uh, UPD, and when you're looking at, uh, particularly sort of when you've got this sort of hybrid Zen apps and desktop deployment, you know, maybe you're publishing apps into a Zen desktop from a, a silo Zen app server or something like that. Effectively, what you need is concurrent profile access. And if you have UPD, that is that is not allowed. You cannot have concurrent profile access. Now, we have got some special tech inside that which does allow you concurrent profile access. So you can actually have two people using the exact same VHD simultaneously. One of the questions is, when you automate the uh, creation of the VHD, which is just part of the product, it will, we will do everything for you. We will create the VHDs, we'll attach the VHDs. Can we set the ACLs on those uh, VHDs to the correct ones? Absolutely. Again, a bit of advanced configuration. You have to know uh, know the format of the um, of the commands and stuff. But yes, you can totally set the ACLs. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people wouldn't actually. If my if my VHD location isn't available, do I have the ability to fall back to another storage location? And uh, that's that is of course yes. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have put it on the slide. And you can configure multiple VHD locations as, uh, as fallbacks. Now, <clears throat> a lot of this configuration takes uh, is in uh, HQ Local Machine. And people will see this immediately and say, well, if it's all in HQ Local Machine, how do I do per user stuff? How do I do a per user VHD location? And you'd think this would be hard, right? Because the per user stuff is in current user, but that's in your profile. And if your profile is not loaded yet, how do you get a current user? What we've got is a really cool way inside the product of creating from a local machine config per user locations for VHDs. So that means that, you know, if you've got a site in uh, New York and a site in London and uh, somebody from New York comes to London, you don't want the Lond uh, that uh, person from New York to get a London location for their profile. They want to be looking back at their New York profile. This is the sort of thing where the per user configuration for VHD locations comes in really handy. So yes, you absolutely can do per user or group VHD locations. Um, <clears throat> Outlook it on line mode if there is an issue. Now this is really key. So particularly um, where you've got um, uh, PVS. So if you're using uh, PVS to distribute uh, uh, your images, you will have a set write cache size. Now, if you have a problem with your network or your storage and that VHD location isn't available, what Outlook will normally do is say, ah, I haven't got an OST, but I'm configured for cache mode. 
So what I will do is I will download a new OST and that will go into your write cache and that will immediately, so if you've configured your write cache as five gig, but your OST is 10 gig, we all know what's gonna happen to that desktop. It's gonna freeze because you've just blown out your write cache. So it's really key to be able to fall back to online mode, especially in a PBS environment, to cope with any kind of uh, network or storage issues. And that's what we'll do. We'll allow that fallback position to be in online mode from cache mode if there is any issue. And um, there's, there's actually quite a bit more, but probably not what we've got time for in, uh, in this particular session. Yeah, but you brought about a very interesting point because you were talking about PBS and it's about uh, how you distribute the uh, golden images. And uh, if you're talking about PBS, you also want to know how do you build uh, the, the golden image. And there was an interesting question here uh, in the chat window and asking about, hey, if you build a single image with all the applications, so it was rather uh, referring to the application masking piece of our product. So on uh, on is it, is it, isn't it counterintuitive because now you build larger and larger images and uh, because you want to mask all the individual applications so you want to have a, a golden image with like 500 apps and you're then you're masking 300 apps for a particular user well uh, this is true for some customers because some customers are very good at building that kind of golden images in particular in conservative markets like in the German speaking market while in other markets they are using more of these application layering technologies and uh, like we said earlier, uh, we work uh, in addition to application layering. So if people really want to layer their applications, then they can do so. That is no problem. And still use application masking to assign those applications to the different users. So this is not an either or question. We can use any technology that helps you to build a single image or a golden image to manage application access for individual users or user groups. Perfect. Um, so we've got another question here around, um, will our license validation withstand an audit by a, a software vendor? Um, so that's a, a, a sort of an easy and a complicated answer. The easy answer is yes. Um, we have multiple customers that um, have completely satisfied their audit requirements from, say, Microsoft or Adobe or other vendors. Um, <clears throat> but you should contact your individual uh, software vendor just to check what their requirements are. Um, like I say, we, we know that we have customers who uh, the big boys are um, perfectly happy with us, but we can't guarantee for every single ISV in the world. So we've got another question. Why would I want to separate my profile from uh, my Office 365? <laughs> that's OST exactly there? the one I. That's exactly the one I also have in front of me. Yeah. Go uh, ahead. Go ahead. Um, so uh, you might not want to actually. So both the Office 365 and the Profile Containers products will um, roam your OST file, um, and you can choose whether you want to keep it in. Uh, in uh, your Office 365 or your profile VHD. Um, so it means that you get that feature, whichever one of those products uh, you get. The difference is, is the indexing, because indexing is not part of your profile. So the profile solution will not roam that part of, uh, of the OS, but the Office 365 product will roam the indexing. And in my opinion, um, indexing is completely necessary to have a good user experience. Yeah, because that's the next question. Hey, search indexing on uh, VDI and RDSH and Synap. Really? Uh, yes, absolutely. Because, uh, well, in the past, uh, indexing has been a pain. Uh, sometimes it still is, but in the past, it also produced a lot of load uh, on the machines. This is not true anymore. So Microsoft, uh, with the latest versions of the operating systems, both uh, server and workstation, they have optimized indexing so that it is not consuming uh, so many resources as it did in the past. So you got to be careful if you have older versions of Windows and you may need to configure uh, certain group policies in order to keep it under control. But with the more modern versions of the operating system, search is not as painful uh, in terms of load as it used to be. So yes, absolutely, you uh, are using search indexing on your RDSH server, absolutely, yes. 
I think that covers. So, so we got uh, uh, another question just on um, Office 365, and somebody they've tested it, um, keeping their OST file on network location. Now, Microsoft does support this, um, but it doesn't support it for any kind of performance queries, and. <clears throat> I don't mind it, but you won't get your indexing. And what will generally happen is that you'll get about sort of 10 to 20 percent um, corruption on it, and it also doesn't support simultaneous access to your to your OST. So <clears throat> I think that if you really want your users to have a um, good Outlook experience, you need your indexing, and you need simultaneous access. There's another question about application layering, like, hey, Citrix, they have their application layering, and so they can do many of the things that FS Logics can do with profile management and with Office 365 um, management. And uh, yes, absolutely, we're good friends with Citrix, and we're kind of, uh, well, filling the gaps. So there are things that Citrix cannot do with their application layering product. For example, they cannot uh, run application layering on uh, Send Up and Send Desktop Essentials, uh, while we can. And uh, so there are many uh, use cases where we just add the FS Logics, one or the other FS Logics module to compensate for something that Citrix cannot do today. And like I said, we keep on working, building new modules, filling the gaps. Uh, our next question is, uh, do you work with AppSense? And I can say that we work with all of Ivanti's many profile solutions. Um, <clears throat> and Office 365 is absolutely designed to work with roaming profiles, with UPD, with AppSense with Res, so it absolutely doesn't matter what your profile solution, if, you, if you've got a sunk investment in a, an existing profile solution, but you need the Office 365 stuff, they will sit perfectly happily together. I like the final question that I have in front of me. How hard is it to do a POC? And to be honest with you, typically we schedule an hour uh, to do a POC as soon as a customer or partner has access to the product install package and has downloaded it and uh, then the installation typically takes less than half hour and uh, so sometimes we don't even need that full hour to do a POC installation after that the customer needs to do some testing and the good news is also they don't need to do it for all their users or all their machines that are out there like Jim said earlier we can configure it so that you can uh, limit it to certain user groups or to certain um, um, RDSH servers, certain Senap servers, uh, so you don't, don't need to do an all or nothing approach. Uh, so you can test it for a handful of users and a machine or two and find out if it's a good solution for you and if it is then you can roll it out. So typically we have a, the, the POC, the initial um, appointment that we have is about an hour and uh, we also walk customers through the, the concepts of the individual module that they're interested in and then we install everything and then we let them test it and a week or two later they typically know if it's good for them or not. Yeah, so I, I, that's absolutely true for the Java, the profiles and the Office 365 modules. The app masking is slightly more complicated because we need to get to know your apps a little bit if we haven't already got templates for uh, for those particular apps. Yeah, that's But correct. even so, it doesn't it doesn't take a, take very much longer. So I think that's the all the all the questions that we have. Um, if you want to get in touch, feel free to uh, to use uh, me, mine or Benny's uh, address or, or, or sales, uh, sales at fslogics.com. That's the most, that's the easiest way to get in touch with us, sales at fslogics.com. Perfect. All right. Um, so there's still no more questions. So we're going to close off. Thank you all for attending. Uh, and thank you, Benny, for uh, for all your live demoing. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Jim. And uh, thank you for all the confidence you had in my live demos. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye-bye.